The end of a NASCAR driver's career can take many forms. The reasons could be financial, physical, or personal. Some make their final start without ever knowing it. Others decide they've had enough and simply step away. Still others decide to make one race their last, most often the Daytona 500. But for many of the sport's greats, they elect a retirement season, a victory lap across the country, giving their fans one more chance to cheer them on. The concept of a retirement season was foreign to NASCAR's pioneers. The dangers of the sport were enough to force a driver's hand. Back injuries got the best of Fred Lorenzen and Pete Hamilton, both winners of the Daytona 500. Lee Petty, Herb Thomas, and Wendell Scott each survived terrible accidents only to lose their competitive edge. And for Joe Weatherly, Fireball Roberts, Tiny Lund, and too many others, their careers ended with their lives. But safety improvements allowed some of NASCAR's biggest names to race well into the 1980s. As the decade began, there were a healthy mix of ageless veterans and spirited up-and-comers, each grabbing up as many victories as the other. But in 1988, seemingly all at once, the old guard stepped aside. It began with Cale Yarborough, who prior to the 1988 season decided to split his full season ride with Dale Jarrett. Two decades later, when Jarrett retired, he would do the same at Michael Waltrip Racing, sharing his ride with David Rudiman. While Jarrett called it a career at the All-Star Race, Yarborough would turn his final laps in the finale at Atlanta. In May, the tire wars between Goodyear and Hoosier left Buddy Baker with serious injuries after a Turn 1 crash in the Coca-Cola 600. By August, he was out of his own full-time ride. Gone, too, was Bobby Allison, who in June suffered the worst crash of his career at Pocono. The first lap wreck with Giacomo Giacomo cost Allison memories of his final Daytona 500 win just four months earlier. At season's end, Benny Parsons would run his final race for Junie Donlavey, then commit to his developing broadcast career with ESPN. Even the Silver Fox, David Pearson, eyed one last hurrah in 1989, reuniting with the Wood Brothers. But after a difficult practice session, the driver with the second most wins in Cup Series history retired at age 54. Once a champion, always a champion. Just like that, Richard Petty stood alone. He'd outlasted them all, but the years had taken their toll. Five years removed from his landmark 200th victory, Petty entered the most frustrating period of his career, his familiar STP Pontiac well back in the running order. Sometime during the first half of the 1991 season, Petty decided he would retire from racing. The announcement came on October 1st, just over a month before the season's end. But unlike his predecessors, he would not leave on such short notice. 1992 was dubbed the Fan Appreciation Tour. On paper, Petty's final season was just another disappointment. He never finished better than 15th, and finished on the lead lap only twice. Cynics considered it nothing more than a cash grab, as the fledgling souvenir market produced an entire series of custom die-casts, one for each race. But the true measure of a driver's final season are the moments between the numbers, the countless tributes, appearances, and autographs. There was one last 4th of July, where a presidential salute was followed by one last moment of glory. Here they come down off the banking to about to complete lap number one. Who is going to have the lead? They're side by side as they come down. Richard Petty is going to lead it. Then, in the season finale, came one final obstacle to overcome. Here comes Richard in the SDP Pontiac. He has the car running again with just two more laps to go, but he will be on the racetrack when the checkered flag drops. It's been, it's been wonderful. I mean, 35 years, the good Lord's looked after us all these years. And, and yeah, I'm still walking around. Uh, you know, I hate to gotten a wreck and disappointed me and some of the fans, but uh, the big deal is we're here talking to you when it's over with, and uh, I, I wouldn't change none of it. I wouldn't trade nothing for nothing else. When it was all said and done, the Fan Appreciation Tour was a success, and it soon became the model for the curtain call of every great driver. The next veteran to retire was another fan favorite, Harry Gant. When the King retired in 1992, Gant had broken Bobby Allison's record as the oldest driver to win a cup race. He was 52 years and 219 days old when he took his 18th and final series win at Michigan. In October 1993, nearing the end of a winless season, Gant announced he would retire in 94. Gant's farewell tour was overshadowed by tragedy. In the 320 days leading up to that year's Daytona 500, four Cup Series drivers lost their lives in separate accidents. 
third of these was Neil Bonnet, whose death led to the abrupt retirement of Jimmy Means, who called it a career that same week. But Gant continued onward and achieved modest results. There was more merchandise and autographs. There was also disappointment. He finished no better than 30th in the first four races and failed to qualify for the spring race at Martinsville, site of his record-tying fourth consecutive win just three years earlier. But his first of seven top tens on the season came at Darlington, capped by a seventh in the Coca-Cola 600, the same night Jeff Gordon scored his first Cup Series victory. Easily the biggest thrill came under the lights at Bristol, where Gant selected Hoosier tires and put his Skull Bandit Chevrolet on the pole, the 17th and final of his career. Now five of the top ten qualifiers are on Hoosier tires, including the entire front row. Jeff Bodine outside row one, and our pole center, 54-year-old Harry Gant, making his final visit to Bristol International Raceway. By season's end, Gant ran a throwback scheme to one of his first cars, fielded by Hal Needham and Burt Reynolds. Both were in attendance when Gant climbed his way to 10th in the final 100 laps at Atlanta, but a cracked oil pan sent smoke into the cockpit, and he fell out 71 laps short of the finish. The Bandit's final ride has come to a conclusion, Harry, what happened? Well, uh, you know, we've had a lot of trouble in Atlanta. We've run good, we've had a lot of trouble. And it's the same thing today, the engine, uh, it just kept getting weaker all day. And uh, finally, it's, uh, you know, the burning, uh, smell of the burning engine just got so much I couldn't breathe no longer. Harry, the fans, the memories, is it possible to roll up for you to sum it up in just a matter of seconds? Well, you know, I think I had a big uh, part in getting NASCAR going in early years, running over the country, getting a sportsman division up to this, and it's a magnitude today, and I'm glad this part of it. I'm glad I'm here in uh, the Western Cup, and uh, I say farewell to all my fans that support me over the years. You've been a part of the memories for so many of us for so long. On behalf of our crew and all the fans, thanks very much. Thank you very much. Thank all you fans. We love you all. Thank you. After the retirements of Richard Petty and David Pearson, Darrell Waltrip became the winningest active driver, and with Gant retired, was also one of the oldest. Little did anyone know that, like Gant, Waltrip had scored the final win of his career during the 92 season, taking the checkers in a rain-shortened Southern 500. During NASCAR's rise in popularity, Waltrip tried to keep pace with his own team, Darwall Enterprises. He poked fun at himself for his reliance on the past champion's provisional to make races, a rule change which came about during Richard Petty's twilight years. But even these provisionals had a tendency to run out. In 1997, to celebrate Waltrip's 25th season in the sport, he ran several throwback schemes to other times in his career. One of these cars failed to qualify for the fall race at Charlotte. This turned out to be the seventh and final year Western Auto and Parts America sponsored Waltrip's team, a relationship that began with the team's inception in 1991. It was the beginning of the end. In early 1998, new sponsorship came from Speedblock, but the company never paid, and Waltrip had to run his team completely out of pocket. He just managed to make it to the fifth race of the season at Darlington, where NASCAR denied him a chance to run the number 300 to honor an ailing Tim Flock. Following a 30th place finish, the number 17 team shut down, but help came from an unlikely ally as Dale Earnhardt signed Waltrip to drive in place of his injured rookie, Steve Park. The result was a 13-race stretch that saw DW finish 5th at Fontana, then nearly break through at Pocono. Waltrip looked to keep things going at Travis Carter Racing in 1999, but the number 66 Kmart Ford was well off the pace. On August 5th, Waltrip announced he would retire with the team in 2000, declaring it his victory tour. After the announcement, Waltrip failed to qualify for six of the next 14 races. Another six DNQs came in 2000, including the Coca-Cola 600, which Waltrip had won five times. Carl Long let him drive in his place. It's perhaps ironic, then, that qualifying gave Waltrip the biggest highlight of his final season. Oh, DW's got a great lap going. That arrow would indicate about where he, we estimate he would be. Somewhere around second, fourth. Can he jump it up a little bit? Oh, he did it! Oh, look at this! D. Fabio! 49.745 average speed, 180.923. Oh, DWB dancing the jig when he gets that one. <laughs> Nicky Shuffle will be back. He's smiling so wide, and listen to this, folks. The, the farewell, what would it mean, DW? 
to roll off on the pole on Saturday and to roll into victory lane as a winner at Indianapolis Motor Speedway. I know you're not going to believe this, but I can win this race. Uh, I felt that coming up here. Uh, Robert and those guys have helped me with the, they've done a good job on my motors. Larry Carter, everybody's done a good job on the car, and uh, I can win this race. I ran really good at Pocono. I didn't get the greatest finish, 22nd, but uh, I, that gave me some confidence coming here because they're very similar. I like coming here. I get excited. I get pumped up, and uh, that's a pretty good start right there. <laughs> Ultimately, he would lose the pole to Ricky Rudd, just as Sterling Marlin had to Richard Petty at Daytona eight years earlier. He finished 11th, the only time he ran better than 20th all season. The season finale at Atlanta, which saw Jerry Nadeau score his first cup victory, came as ESPN signed off for what was then the final time. Waltrip, who won the first race ESPN ever broadcast, finished 34th. The next series of retirement seasons took on a different complexion, as many of the top drivers of the 1980s and 90s weren't so willing to retire altogether. The decision now was to retire from full-time competition in the Cup Series, leaving open opportunities to run in different divisions for any number of years. It is possible that this is what drivers had meant all along. In 1993, Richard Petty ran some laps around Indianapolis before the first Brickyard 400, Harry Gant filled in for an injured Bill Elliott in the 1996 All-Star Race and would also run a few truck series races. The trucks also attracted Daryl Waltrip, who ran eight races after his final season and even ran a Bush Series race at Martinsville in 2006. The trendsetter this time was Bill Elliott, the sport's most popular driver. In late 2003, Elliott had scored a convincing victory at Rockingham, then came within one lap and one blown tire of winning at Homestead. He remained purposefully vague on if he continued to run full-time in 2004. The announcement came on December 4th, 2003. Elliott would run part-time in a new number 91 Dodge for Ray Evernham, leaving open his full-time ride in the number 9 for rookie Casey Kane. That October, as Kane was well on his way to Rookie of the Year, two more drivers followed Elliott's lead. On October 12th, two-time champion Terry Labonte announced his Shifting Gears Tour. He would run 10 races in 2005, another 10 in 2006, then call it a career. Like Elliott, Labonte would run a new entry from his current team at Hendrick Motorsports, driving the familiar number 44 he campaigned for Billy Hagen. Unlike Elliott, Labonte would also run a number of throwback schemes, both to the Piedmont Airlines and Kellogg's cars he made famous. This move opened a ride for another future Rookie of the Year, Kyle Busch. Two days later, on October 14th, Mark Martin announced that 2005 would be his final year competing full-time, but like Elliott, stated that he would run part-time for any number of years afterward. The Salute to You tour would start in Daytona and wrap up at Homestead. Like Labonte's effort, Martin would run several throwback schemes to his career. Not only would he run the Stroh's Light, Folgers, and Valvoline cars he previously ran at Roush, but also a scheme resembling his ASA car that ran at Phoenix. Still another driver joining in was Rusty Wallace, who in the spring of 2004 snapped a three-year winless streak with a victory in Martinsville. On August 30th, 2004, Wallace declared he would hang up the helmet for good at the end of 2005, Rusty's last call. Like Martin, Wallace would run a handful of throwback schemes to earlier phases of his career, featuring a recreation of Midnight at Chicagoland and a special scheme for the night race at Bristol, honoring his nine wins there. With neither Elliott nor Labonte in the field for the Daytona 500, the focus turned to Martin and Wallace, and if either could score their first victory in the Great American Race. But in a cruel twist, both drivers wrecked their primary cars in the Gatorade duels. Wallace went to a backup car, but Martin wasn't so confident in his. I could win the Daytona 500 with that car. Can you win the Daytona from the five? Can you win the 500 from the back in the backup car? Absolutely not. Never happened. Uh, that car could win, though. Very disappointed, Mark. Have another one like that, though. I'm sorry. Somehow, the Roush Racing team pieced Martin's car back together, and he joined Wallace in the lead pack for the run to the checkers. But well, GD, don't count Mark Martin out yet. He said, has the message to Rusty Wallace with this big old motor and me pushing and him pushing me. There ain't no way they can stop us. In the end, Martin finished sixth, then Wallace in tenth. The two remained equally strong throughout the championship season. 
While Wallace finished eighth in points without a win, Martin took the checkers at Kansas, won two Bush Series races, claimed his second All-Star race, and also took the IROC title. He finished fourth in Cup Series points and was just inches from beating Greg Biffle for the win at Homestead. While Wallace would never race again, Martin would compete until 2013, including four more full-time seasons. Terry Labonte would likewise continue to race well past the end of his Shifting Gears tour. Thanks to his experience in his past Champions Provisional, Labonte was eagerly sought out to help develop struggling teams. During 2005, when Jason Leffler was released from Joe Gibbs Racing's new FedEx team, Labonte made a number of starts before they eventually hired Denny Hamlin. He did the same thing in 2006, taking the place of Tony Raines at Gibbs' sister team, Hall of Fame Racing. One of these runs at Sonoma saw Labonte lead 17 laps and finish third. Texas T would run until 2014, rounding out his career as a part-timer for Go Fast Racing. Interestingly, his brother Bobby Labonte would take over in 2015 and retire the next year. Overshadowed by Martin Wallace and Labonte was yet another driver, Ricky Rudd. True to his quiet demeanor, NASCAR's Iron Man elected to retire at the end of 2005 without much fanfare. So little, in fact, that his crew chief, Fatback McSwain, gave an emotional speech on his behalf during the driver's meeting at Homestead. But as with the other three, Rudd's retirement was somewhat premature. He made a one-off appearance the very next year, driving for an injured Tony Stewart at Dover. And in 2007, he earned one more full-time ride with Robert Yates Racing, taking over when Dale Jarrett went to Michael Waltrip Racing. But a series of injuries, capped by a hard crash at Fontana, put him on the sidelines for five of his last 11 starts. Jarrett retired at MWR the next year. It's perhaps appropriate that the current streak of driver retirements began with Jeff Gordon, who in 1992 made his first Cup Series start the day Richard Petty made his last. Like Petty, Gordon electrified the Daytona crowd in qualifying in 2015, and this time held the pole for his final Daytona 500. Like Martin, he found his way to victory lane, prevailing in a wild finish at Martinsville. Great like that. Yeah! We're going to Homestead! The drive for five very nearly became a reality in Gordon's final run in the number 24. It's a happy, happy good day. I want that win, but... Uh... We're still gonna celebrate. <laughs> he then closed out his career to help another driver, this time an injured Dale Earnhardt Jr. in 2016. Both are now broadcasters, still in friendly competition. I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure what, what, the, what the feeling is. I didn't have any real, I didn't cry until I was hugging Rick, Rick's neck, man. He's been like a father to me and the things that he's done for me. Uh, personally and professionally, but the personal stuff, you know, he's really, really helped me more than anybody will ever know, and uh, he's done that for a lot of people, and uh, so I uh, will miss trying to make him proud, you know, and I know I'll still be able to do things that will make him proud, because he's like a daddy, but I'll miss trying, I'll miss driving his cars and um, trying to make him proud on the racetrack. When Junior's Appreciation Tour came to a close at Homestead in 2017, he rolled down pit road alongside his old rival, Matt Kenseth. Kenseth ran a throwback scheme of his own as he faced an uncertain future, but even the quiet Wisconsin native wasn't denied one last celebration as he clawed his way to victory under the Arizona sun. I don't know what to say except for uh, thank the Lord. Uh, it's, been a, it's been an amazing journey. Um, I know I'm a big baby right now, but uh, just got one race left. Um, everybody dreams of going out a winner, so uh, you know we won today. Nobody can take that one away from us. It's a heck of a race with Chase there. Uh, Golly, just thanks uh, DeWalt, Circle K, Toyota, and all our, uh, all our sponsors, and uh, JJR for a great five years. It's been uh, quite the journey here the last 20, and thank you, fans. I appreciate it. Always a racer, forever a champion was the slogan for Tony Stewart's swan song in 2016. And like Gordon, there were fireworks when he made it to victory lane. Stewart inside. Oh, he is there. there. He what gets the Hamlin. They Whoa. hit. And Stewart comes off turn 11. Oh, Look at that. Oh, He's oh, coming oh, to the flag. How did that Tony happen? Tony Stewart How did that happen? Especially at a place you're going to for your last time, that means a bunch. So it's, um... <laughs> It's special, trust me. <laughs> Curiously, Stewart's last cup start at Homestead also turned out to be the last for Carl Edwards, who Stewart had fought to the final lap for his third and final title. Such is the unpredictability of sports. And so the question now remains, what will be the signature moment of Jimmy Johnson's final season? Or have we seen it already? 
Was it a few weeks ago at Fontana, where he qualified on the outside pole, led a five-wide salute, and took the green flag with his wife and children in the flag stand? Or is that moment still yet to come? Only time, and perhaps history, will truly tell. So what was your favorite retirement season? Or is there one that I didn't mention in this video? Make sure you mention it in the comments below. As always, thank you guys for your support. Special thanks to our supporters in the last Rion. And as always, stay tuned for more content here on YouTube.